friends, Miss Cassie here with Solon Public Library's Digital Story Time. This week we are going to read stories about dragons, both imaginary dragons and real dragons. <laughs> but first we need to sing our welcome song and we need to get our clapping hands ready. So we're going to wiggle our fingers and shake our hands and rub them together really fast, really fast, really fast and put them on our knees. Okay. If you wanna read a book, clap your hands. If you wanna read a book, clap your hands. If you wanna read a book, have a seat and take a look. If you wanna read a book, clap your hands. Okay, what comes after we clap our hands? That's right, we stomp our feet. If you wanna read a book, stomp your feet. If you wanna read a book, stomp your feet. If you wanna read a book, have a seat and take a look. If you wanna read a book, stomp your feet. Okay, what comes after we stomp our feet? That's right, we twirl around. If you want to read a book, twirl around. If you want to read a book, twirl around. If you want to read a book, have a seat and take a look. If you want to read a book, twirl around. Okay, for our last verse, we're going to be as quiet as we can. And we're going to whisper, hooray. If you want to read a book, whisper hooray, hooray. If you want to read a book, whisper hooray, hooray. If you want to read a book, have a seat and take a look. If you want to read a book, whisper hooray, hooray. <laughs> All right, friends, this is our last summer story time, so it's going to be the last time we sing our Once Upon a Time song. So we are going to do it twice this week. So get your storybooks ready. Here we go. Once upon a time so grand, we listened to stories from across the land with kings and queens and dragons too, folktale heroes with oxen blue. Once upon a time so grand, we listened to stories from across the land. All right, second time. Once upon a time so grand, we listened to stories from across the land with kings and queens and dragons too, folktale heroes with oxen blue. Once upon a time so grand, we listened to stories from across the land. Yay! Our first book today is called The Knight and the Dragon, and it's written and illustrated by Tommy DePaula. Now let's see, knights and dragons, they, are they usually friends, knights and dragons? No, they're usually fighting each other, right? The knight is defending or trying to rescue a princess or a castle. And, uh, and the dragon is trying to protect its treasure, maybe. So they don't usually get along very well. Once upon a time, there was a knight in a castle who had never fought a dragon. And in a cave not too far away was a dragon who had never fought a knight. One day, the knight went to the castle library and took out all of the books he could find on dragon fighting. The library is a good place to go when you want to learn something, right? Meanwhile, back at the cave, the dragon had rummaged through all the things from his ancestors and found some books on night fighting. The knight began to build some armor. Oh, so look, he's reading a book on how to build armor. 
and he's melting down the metal and he's pouring it into the shape that he needs and yeah he's putting together his suit of armor to protect him I think in his fight with the dragon don't you think the dragon practice swishing his tail do you think that that is a good fighting strategy for a dragon when he's fighting a knight probably Meanwhile, back at the castle, what is the knight doing? What are these pictures telling us? What do you think? Yeah, he's getting his weapons ready. He's sharpening his sword. He's making sure his bow and arrow is straight. He's shining his lances and oh i forget what those are called with the spiky balls on them and he's painting his shield so that he is ready to go meanwhile back at the cave the dragon is also getting ready what is the dragon doing what does it look like the dragon's doing yeah he's practicing his scary faces can you make some scary dragon faces? Maybe you're baring your teeth and you're putting up your claws and maybe you're making scary noises. Ready? We're gonna do it together. Grrr, or roar. Yeah, that's how dragons fight, right? They scare. And then the knight is running towards a wooden dragon, but he misses him. And the dragon is running towards a straw knight. And he also misses him. He doesn't catch him on fire at all. I think they both have a lot of practice to do. Oh, and look, they practiced and they practiced. And look, now the knight is able to hit the wooden dragon with his lance. And the dragon is able to catch all kinds of different straw knights on fire. Look. He's not even trying, it's so easy now. Finally, the knight and the dragon were both ready. They sent each other a lesson and set a time for the fight. So look, the knight shows up at the dragon's cave. They've been practicing, they've both been practicing. So who do you think is gonna win this fight? Do you think the knight is gonna win? Or, do you think the dragon is going to win? Hmm. Let's read more and find out. They start at either end of the field and they run right past each other. And then they turn around and they try it again and they run right past each other again. Oh no! All of their practice, that's not working out. So they try it one more time. They run towards each other. Oh no, the dragon ends up in the pool, in the pond, and the knight gets stuck in the tree. But hmm, who's that with the horse and the carriage? I wonder what she's doing. <gasps> it's the librarian with her bookmobile. <laughs> So she hands them each a book. So she hands the dragon the outdoor cookbook and she hands the knight how to build a barbecue. Hmm, interesting. And they read the books. And what do they do? They team up and they make K and D barbecue. What do you think the K and the D stand for? Knight and dragon. And look, the dragon's using his flames to cook the meat on the, on the knight's lances as the barbecue spit. And the knight is serving them to the people in the kingdom. The end. What a great story. Sometimes we think that we have to fight other people or we can't get along with other people just because they're different and because our two groups have never gotten along. 
But look, the knight and the dragon found out that instead, not only did they not have to fight each other, but they could actually help each other and they could do something together that they would never be able to do independently. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, we are going to sing Roar Went the Dragon. And this is one that you can sing and you can um, walk in a circle if you want. And you, if you have other people at home watching with you, have them stand up and you're going to march in a circle with them too. So we're going to go in a circle and then at the end, roar, we're going to turn to the middle of the circle and roar uh, like the dragon. So here we go. In and out the castle gate, the knight chased the dragon. The knight thought it was all in good fun. Roar went the dragon. <laughs> Yay! All right, let's do it again. Maybe you can go in a different direction in your circle. Here we go. In and out the castle gate, the knight chased the dragon. The knight thought it was all in good fun. Roar went the dragon. <laughs> Just like the knight and the dragon became friends in our last book, our next book we're going to read is about a woman who also became friends with dragons. So we are going to sing a friend of mine to the tune of My Fair Lady. And our first action that we're going to do is we're going to clap. So can you clap with me? Perfect. Here we go. Will you be a friend of mine? Friend of mine? Friend of mine? Will you be a friend of mine and clap along with me? Excellent. Next, we're going to stomp. Ready? Will you be a friend of mine? Friend of mine? Friend of mine? Will you be a friend of mine and stomp along with me? Good job. All right. And lastly, let's see, what should our last action be? Um, how about we tap our shoulders? Will you be a friend of mine? Friend of mine? Friend of mine? Will you be a friend of mine and tap along with me? Good job! Yay! <laughs> Our last book for today is called Joan Proctor, Dragon Doctor, The Woman Who Loved Reptiles. And it's written by Patricia Valdez and illustrated by Felicita Sala. Now, I didn't think dragons were real. Did you think dragons were real? So let's find out who these dragons are that Joan Proctor is a doctor for. Now this is a true story. Joan Proctor was a real person and she really worked with lots of different kinds of reptiles. So let's find out more about her and about the cool animals that she worked with. Back in the days of long skirts and afternoon teas, a little girl named Joan Proctor entertained the most unusual party guests. Slithery and scaly, they turned over teacups. They crawled past the crumpets. While other girls read stories about dragons and princesses, Joan read books about lizards and crocodiles. Instead of a favorite doll, a favorite lizard accompanied her wherever she went. Each day after school, Joan retreated to her bedroom where she studied lizards, snakes, and turtles. She took careful notes, just like a scientist. And on the days that Joan was too sick to attend school, tiny toes and eager eyes cheered her up. The reptiles were quiet and watchful, just like Joan. For her 16th birthday, Joan received a most curious gift, a baby crocodile. She tied a little ribbon around his waist and took him for a walk. I mean, 
I guess crocodiles need walks just like dogs do. <laughs> she even brought him to math class one day. The students shrieked. The teacher recoiled. Apparently, crocodiles were not welcome at school. I probably could have guessed that, right? When Joan grew older, she skipped the parties and dances with her friends. Instead, she sought out the curator of reptiles and fish at the Natural History Museum. There, Joan and the curator talked snake, size, talked snake scales, size, shape, texture, patterns, and even evolution. Sometimes Joan smuggled in her crocodile to the delight of the curator. He knew right away that Joan was special. The curator, a curator of a museum is someone who's in charge of all the collections. But soon, these carefree days came to an end. England was at war. Women took up jobs left behind by men. And the curator found himself short-staffed at the museum, so he hired Joan as his assistant. Joan flourished at the Natural History Museum. As a scientist, she surveyed the museum's vast collections and published research papers on pit vipers and pancake tortoises. As an artist, she created exquisite models and drawings for the reptile exhibits. When the curator retired, Joan took over. Men returning from war were surprised to see a woman in charge, but times were changing and Joan was leading the way. She sounds like the perfect person to be in charge of the museum, don't you think? If she knows so much about the reptiles and she can draw pictures to help people um, learn about them too, that sounds like the perfect match. A few years later, the London Zoo decided to replace its old, outdated reptile house. The zoo director asked Joan to design a new home for the animals. Joan knew exactly how to keep reptiles happy. She added elaborate lighting and state-of-the-art heaters that provided hot spots to keep the cold-blooded animals warm. She brought in plants and created artwork that mimicked each animal's natural environment. Did you know that reptiles need warm rocks to stay warm? Yeah, that's why sometimes you'll see lizards sunbathing on rocks. It's to keep them warm because they aren't able to warm their bodies themselves. Joan took extra care designing one enclosure in particular. By this time, stories had emerged of a fierce man-eating lizard with a long forked tongue living in the faraway Indonesian island of Komodo. It was rumored to be 30 feet long and faster than a motor car and stronger than an ox. They called it, do you have any guesses? They called it the Komodo Dragon. But these stories didn't frighten Joan. She dreamed of studying the dragons up close. On opening day of the new reptile house, visitors packed the zoo. They gawked at the geckos. They peered at the pythons. And they marveled at the monitors. But when they reached Joan's special enclosure, they gasped. Two seven-foot-long lizards stared back at them. Real-life dragons. Although the visitors were thrilled, Joan was concerned. One of the Komodo dragons, Sumbawa, did not look well. To the shock of the zoo guests, Joan entered the enclosure. She moved Sumbawa to the reptile clinic with the help of six nervous keepers. So there was Joan and then six other people 
for one reptile. They, and they were afraid. But was Joan afraid? Mm -mm, Joan was not afraid. The dragon let Joan clean a sore in its mouth with no fuss at all. In fact, he thanked Joan by licking her face. <laughs> That's like what dogs and cats do, huh? Joan thought Sumbawa was brave. The keepers thought Joan was brave. News of Joan and the Komodo dragons spread. Reporters flocked to the reptile house with questions. Had she ever been bitten? Was she afraid of the dragons? What kind of woman runs a reptile house? Joan wished the reporters would ask about the animals instead of her. Joan cared for each and every creature in the reptile house. From daily health checks to delicate surgeries, her dedication and talent could not be matched. Scientists all over the world read about Joan's research, her clinical skills, and the success of the new reptile house. She became an international sensation. That means people from all over the world heard about the amazing work that she was doing. The Zoological Society of London invited Joan to present her Komodo dragon research at a scientific meeting. As Joan took the stage, she wheeled out Sumbawa, sitting freely atop a large table. The audience squirmed in their seats. Usually scientific presentations are just people reading from reports that they've done, but she brought her Komodo dragon with her to show people. Joan stroked Sumbawa's head and fed him a pigeon. He ate it in one gulp. Sumbawa wandered through the audience as Joan explained that the reports of Komodo dragons were greatly exaggerated. They could not grow up to 10, they could grow up to 10 feet, not 30 feet. They ran fast, but not as fast as a motor car, and they could be fierce, but they were mostly gentle. When Joan finished her presentation, Sumbawa returned to her side, and the audience erupted in applause. That would be pretty cool if you were sitting in a big auditorium and a giant lizard walked past you. That's a pretty cool presentation. Joan's passion for reptiles never waned. For the rest of her life, she could be found walking or riding through the zoo with Sumbawa by her side. And just like when she was a little girl, Joan often hosted children's tea parties at the reptile house with her scaly friends. And Sumbawa was the guest of honor. That would be a pretty fun tea party. I would like to go to that, wouldn't you? <laughs> now at the end of this book, there are real photographs of Joan Proctor. And here's one right here with her and her baby crocodile. Do you see how small the crocodile is that she's holding? And it also has some more information about Komodo dragons and a bibliography, which is other books about the same topic that might be interesting to you. So if you want to read more about Joan Proctor, Dragon Doctor, and about Komodo dragons, you can check this book out from the library and read even more. Okay, friends, this is our last summer story time. And don't forget to turn in all of your summer reading logs and minutes. Everything is due by Saturday, August 8th. So make sure you get all of your trackers in so that you can enter for a chance to win some of our awesome summer reading prizes. And next week, we will be, uh, we'll be starting our next story time theme, which is about things that go. <laughs> so bikes and boats and cars and trucks. It will be very fun. But now it's time to sing our goodbye song. We read a book when we played a game when we sang a song together We read a book and we played a game We had a fun adventure Now 
I'll go read a book and go play.